Hi, my name is Maimuna Jalo. I'm a storyteller based in Nairobi, Kenya. I've always loved words and I used to be a journalist. I also worked in communications with various NGOs. And now I concentrate on performance storytelling and many different projects all around stories. Storytelling for me is about being able to tell your story, whether it's a personal story or a story that is based on a folk tale or an adaptation of a novel, there are you know, different forms of storytelling and here I'm talking mainly about performance storytelling and it's about being able to present your world and your ideas and your culture and your identity to people around you and also to people around the world. It's really about reclaiming your voice um, celebrating our past because in African storytelling I mean it's a legacy that we have from our forefathers oral storytelling was a massive part of our culture and slowly it's been dying although there are great efforts to revive it so it's about preserving that history but also making it relevant to audiences of today I think so. I think that stories are incredibly meaningful. Uh, a lot of the time they transmit values. So when you look at traditional folk tales, there are many stories around respecting your elders, for example, or not being greedy, or making sure that you're fair. So they are very fundamental values that we can transmit through stories, and a lot of the traditional folk tales contain those values. It was a way of teaching children about social norms and behavior without necessarily pointing the finger and saying, don't do this, don't do that. When you cage it in a story, you give the listener an opportunity to draw from it what they want and to think back and often there are songs or riddles and that stays with them. And for example, when I perform with songs, what the kids go away with often is that song that they will repeat and hopefully there'll be something in the story that will stay with them. I like telling stories to adults. Um, my stories tend to be quite political in a way. Uh, they have a very strong social message. So be it about uh, women and the right to own their bodies and control their destinies, how they survive in a patriarchal system. And those are the stories that I like to tell because I'm an African feminist. So I really think that we should hear from as many different voices as we can because none of us are one dimensional. Uh, so by having different kinds of stories, being told by different tellers, you're reaching different people. I think anyone can be a storyteller. Um, if you'd asked me five years ago if I ever thought that I'd be on a stage telling a story, I would have said, Absolutely not, um, because I entered storytelling story really accidentally. Initially, I was looking for East African folk tales, and what I wanted to do was to collect them and archive them so that they'd be available in schools. A lot of our education system is still very colonial. We still learn that A is for apple, uh, even though we don't grow apples. And so I came from the perspective of how do we make sure that children have content that reflects their own reality, that reminds them of where they came from um, because I really believe if you don't know where you came from, how do you know where you're going? I think we all have stories, right? I think that from the moment of birth you come with a certain background, whoever your parents are, the story of where you were conceived, of how they met, so already you're born with many stories. Um, so everyone has a story to tell and some people might choose to do it through film, through theatre, through storytelling. Some people might choose not to tell their story at all. Um, but I do think that it's something that we all have. It's a gift that we all have and we all have very different stories. You know, when I look at the world and you think about the billions of people on this planet and we all have a different fingerprint and every single one of us has a different story, that's pure magic. I think that stories are incredibly powerful, that they definitely can change the world. It allows me to see you and for you to see me. When you hear my story, suddenly you can realize how similar we are, that we all love, that we all sometimes hate, that we need friendship, that we need human contact. 
it makes us realize really how many similarities that we have and that we all matter in our own way. So I do think that they're incredibly powerful. But I also think that stories need to be followed up with some kind of action. It's not enough just to tell a story about injustice if you don't do anything about that injustice. You know, nowadays we have this sort of social media culture where we think that if we call something out on Twitter or on Facebook that it's enough. Sort of, what do they call them, couch activists. Um, and there's a danger that we think that with just the little that we do it's enough and I really don't believe that. I think that we need serious change, systematic change and action. There's this idea that um, across Africa, in all the many countries, Africa is not a country, that um, storytelling is still very much alive because so many stories originated there and oral traditions come from Africa. Um, but the reality is that it's a dying form. So when you speak to young people, a lot of them have never ever been told a story. What's great is that there are efforts by different storytellers in different countries to sort of revive this tradition because it's incredibly important. Um, it's a way to transmit messages, it's to represent your world, your country, um, what it's like. Um, so I think it's important that it stays alive, but I also embrace the fact that there are many different forms of storytelling um, across the continent. I live in Kenya and if you see what, for example, um, fashion designers are doing, what musicians are doing, uh, what people are doing in theatre around telling their own story. It's incredible and I think that it's okay to mix and match those different formats as long as you're still getting the opportunity to represent your world, um, to tell the stories that matter to you, to tell the stories that you want other people to know about you. Um, it's okay to use different formats and different styles, but the need to preserve the tradition is also very important. There's a certain disdain sometimes around things that are traditionally African by us as Africans ourselves. You know, there's this clamor for modernity and sometimes we throw away what is ours. We don't value it. Um, so I think that the efforts to preserve storytelling and oral cultures is a very valid one, a very valuable one. One of the things um, that I've been working with is audio. So in the anthology of stories, we also turn them into audio stories. And I keep thinking that this is a great medium to reach different communities um, because a lot of people don't necessarily read or they might not have an opportunity to be told a story by a storyteller. And yet we love radio. Radio is still king across the continent. People really listen to the radio. So how can we use audio as a way to make sure that we can collect more stories, we can record people's stories and then distribute them as broadly and as widely as possible so that people who don't read, can't read, won't read, don't want to read, all these people can still access stories. I want to make sure that, um, that there's not this sort of class divide um, in the same way that oral storytelling was so democratic. You could, you know, join in a storytelling session. Uh, reading can be a very non-democratic space, right? You buy a book, you read it by yourself. But now we have all these audio stories and podcasts and I think that's something that we can use to make sure that we spread the love of stories because if people enjoy stories then they're going to look for them more. Um, but also for people to be able to hear stories from their own communities because you can record stories from those communities and then play them back to them. And often we live in societies that are very stratified. You have this neighborhood where the rich people live, this neighborhood where the poor people live, and there's little opportunity or little willingness uh, to come together and hear each other's stories. And I think that maybe through audio podcasts, through audio books, through audio projects generally. So at the moment we're trying to set up um, audio booths uh, in roadside kiosks, roadside shops, so that people can come in and listen to stories. So let's use technology as well, you know, we don't have to shun technology and say this is at a traditional form and this is how it must remain. We can use technology to make sure that um, the culture of listening to stories remains alive.
One of the things that I've found really interesting in this journey, uh, where I've been to different festivals, is, well, here, for example, a Mexican storyteller tell a story, and I'll be like, oh my goodness, I, I know that story. And I realize that there's a version that we tell in Kenya or in Ghana. And that's, that's been really interesting, how some stories are universal or they've traveled. Um, if you look at Anansi the Spider, Anansi the Spider um, is uh, based on a Ghanaian uh, folk tale and he's a trickster character. And they have Anansi the Spider in Jamaica as well. So it's one of the characters that was taken by slaves who were taken from the west coast of Africa to the Caribbean. And you can really see that movement of stories. So in a sense, stories are something that really connect us. As Africans, we've been spread across the globe because of the transatlantic slave trade, um, more recently because of immigration, for example. But stories are something that can still link us. I tell one story called Sheila's Journey, and it's the story of a little girl who goes in search of her parents who have been kidnapped by slave traders. And during the journey, she goes to the Caribbean. And for me, it was very important to mention real things, so some similarities. So I talk about the food that she eats when she gets there, because I'm trying to draw this link that despite the fact that we've been ripped apart, that there are certain things that still you know, bring us together, like food and song and dance and stories as well. Um, so, for example, one of the stories that I tell is called The Big Nest, and it's written by a South Sudanese writer, so it's actually a written story, um, which I then perform, and his name is Ali Majok. And if you know anything about South Sudan, you'll know that it's a country that has suffered a very, very long civil war um, and that has caused the displacement of tens of thousands of people. So in this story, he tells it through the perspective of a little bird. And he tells the story of that displacement, of having to move, of losing parents, of losing family. And for me, I think that those stories are very important because they allow us to see the cost of war, for example. Um, and at the same time, it's told through these little birds so little children can still access this story. So there's such a big variety of stories and I think that all of them are very important.